Welcome to Critical Role Demystified, where we talk about the lessons we can learn from episodes of Critical Role as DMs and as players. I'm Mike Christensen, and today we're talking about episode 11 of the Vox Machina campaign, The Temple Showdown. This episode has the full cast, and it is also four and a half hours long, if you do not count the Just Dance section at the end of the episode. It's also a bit notorious, but we'll have plenty to talk about in the back half of this episode. But let's start with the recap, and let's start with the first three hours. Yeah, we kind of have to break it down like that. This is quite the episode. Vex, Vax, and Scanlan are hiding poorly from a malformed purple giant, what I have been intimately familiar with thanks to some machinations from a former DM of mine. This is a Fomorian. Scanlan really badly does not want them to kill the giant. He wants to try to capture it and maybe use it against Kavarn in some way. Although Sam is actually absent for the beginning of the episode, he's stuck in traffic for the first 20 minutes, so he's actually texting this to the group so they don't just kill the giant. Don't text and drive. Just putting that out there. I'm a hypocrite. I text all the time while I'm driving. Don't tell anybody. The party fights the giant, and after doing some damage and briefly knocking it out with a sleep arrow, they manage to tie it up long enough for Keyleth to cast Gaius on it. Gaius is a spell that allows you to control the mind of a target essentially giving it commands that it has to follow, otherwise it takes psychic damage for 30 days. It's the spell that I use as the plot hook for my Suicide Squad campaign. Basically, you know, do what I say or your brain will explode. It's a good spell. But Keyleth has to give him the commands because she's the one who casts the spell, but Vex and Pike are the ones who actually speak under common, which Keyleth does not. So she has to relay her messages through them. He's asking where, we should tell him. Tell him where. Um, but tell him to stay for now. Yes. Well, you here <laughs> for now. She's gonna translate. You, I love this. we like roll death. together. <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> go ahead, tra- go ahead, tra- translate that. <laughs> Vex, you got that. Could you translate that? I didn't even understand. Uh, <laughs> did you want to tell him what you said? Oh, yeah. We oh. rolled deep. I, I speak Keyleth. She's saying <laughs> she's saying that he should wait here until our instructions to attack. Okay. I need to make more of my monsters not speak common. Fewer of my monsters speak common. I need to do this more often because it makes the choices of language by the players actually more relevant. It's also entertaining as heck. They decide to name the giant Tiny. Grog offers Tiny a sip from the cask of ale, the same cask that Matt emptied in episode seven when Travis was not at the table, and then retconned to still have some ale in it when Travis was back at the table. Because if you want to do resource management at your table, you need your players to be on board with it. Otherwise, in this case, you realize, like Matt did, before there were any consequences, thankfully, that you would effectively be robbing your player of the opportunity to RP about how much his character loves ale, which is something that that player really loves to do. Travis loves pulling out the cask of ale at relevant times to be helpful in the way that Grog feels he can be. But Matt still does seize this opportunity to remove this apparently constantly full cask of ale from the game while still giving Grog slash Travis a chance to do a little bit of RP around the loss of the ale. He takes it in his hand, which in him it looks like a small mug. Right, just to, just to see. Oh, he's gonna drink the whole cast. Yeah. He's gonna drink the whole cast. He's gonna drink the, the top of it off, Don't do breaking the me. wood. And Don't do it. <laughs> I will fucking kill you. <laughs> <laughs> no. ah! I would like. <laughs> no, 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 <laughs> I run up his fat chest and I headbutt him in the face. Oh shit! <laughs> natural twenty. Oh, oh shit. he's no. really oh, God. That is a natural twenty. You don't fuck with Grog's oh, cask of ale. Oh, Quick God. lyrics don't lie. As Grog runs up full force, angrily slams his his Goliath skull into this large Fomorian underdark giant. Mm-hmm. You hear what sounds like a clap of thunder nearby, and you swear for a second one of the two heads are about to crack or explode from the sheer force of the impact. You see Grog, whose head is approximately a fifth the size of this entity, Ooh. has hit it with force so strong that in that breathless moment, you're waiting for Grog to scream out in pain with blood pouring down his face. 
However, it is the Fomorian who reels back from the force of the blow, his giant eye closing in severe pain before he falls onto his back, stunned. You owe me a cask of ale. It's a really smart workaround, a really elegant solution to the fact that Grog is constantly drinking from this cask that really should be empty by now. And it's one of the most memorable moments of the Craghammer arc. They start making a plan for how they're going to breach the temple and attack Kavarn. And I'm going to abbreviate some of this because as much as I enjoy watching people make plans during games of D&D, that sounded facetious, but it really was not. I love watching people in D&D make plans. There are many episodes of Critical Role where the players will spend a long time making a plan, and even though I'm from the future, I know what plan they ended up landing on, I'll still go back and watch those scenes sometimes, because I just think they're really entertaining and interesting. Episode 67 has my favorite. This is not a joke, this is not a bit. But it doesn't make for a very interesting recap, so I'm gonna hit you with the final plan that they land on. First, Vax and Scanlan go into the city on a flying carpet to do a little bit more recon, trying to figure out where the most illithids are, and it turns out there are hundreds of illithids, far too many to count. And Vax has the idea to release Tiny into the city as a distraction, but Clarota, that's unacceptable to him. And Percy, Vex, and Tiberius have all, at various points through the planning process, mentioned that they really want to liberate the Mind Flayers, not, you know, kill a bunch of them. But in order to actually get the support of the Mind Flayers, they need to free them from the mind control. There's a mind control device hanging over the Elder Brain like an upside down Christmas tree. If they destroy it, it's going to lance right into the Elder Brain and either destroy or do quite a bit of damage to the central hub of the Mind Flayers, which again, Clarota will not allow. That is completely unacceptable. And additionally, will not exactly get them any support from the Mind Flayers. So they go over to the temple very silently in two trips, because there are just so many of them, and they begin very carefully weakening the support beams that are holding up this device uh, to the ceiling or the open ceiling, the formerly open ceiling of the pyramid. They're going to weaken the restraints on one side and then drop Tiny from the flying carpet. They're gonna polymorph him into a mouse, then drop him and turn him into a giant. He'll hit those beams and it will swing. That way it won't just lance directly into Elder Brain, it'll swing off to the side. They want the thing destroyed, but not crushing the Elder Brain like the Elder Brain is Alec Trevelyan at the end of Goldeneye as the satellite falls on him. And I would much rather watch Goldeneye than watch the last two hours of this episode. The party is aware that Kavarn's vision cancels out magic. They know that he has this anti-magic cone coming from his central eye. So they agree that they probably shouldn't try to get too close to attack. But Grog proposes brilliantly that they need to be able to control where Kavarn looks. He can't just keep looking up at the ceiling because he's gonna basically be able to destroy them. They have to have some way to keep his eye moving from one to another. So probably some people are gonna have to go into the temple. This is where the plan shifts. This is where we start hearing the phrase, we will go in if we need to. We'll come back to this. Can I just say, I have no idea what's about to happen, but it's been a great pleasure to oh. walk beside each and every one of you. Oh, are you doing, the, are do you doing the, it's been an honor to serve with you, this. sir? Why would you say that? All right. Right. All right. Screw you, I want my final words with you to be indignant and irritated. The scene with the cask of ale is great, but this may actually be my favorite part of the episode. They do some acid damage to the beams and then Keyleth heats them with heat metal as Tiberius takes the carpet as high as it can with the mouse. The party hands out inspirations and death wards, they cast stone skin and blur, they click their boosts of haste, they rage, they get ready. Tiberius drops the mouse and the moment it leaves his hand, Scanlan turns Tiny back into a Fomorian. The Fomorian goes slamming into the glass you hear the cracking and crashing sound of the planes as they shatter the metal structures. This horrible breaking, bending sound as they bend inward and slam into the side of the inside of the temple. The Fomorian goes streaking down, slams into the ground from that height, taking. The German judge does not like. Oh, wow. Tiny dies instantly. So one of their concerns was that Tiny would be mind controlled by Kavarn while he was in the temple. That's not gonna be a problem. There's a lot of this fight we're going to come back to during the lessons portion of this video, but I wanna hit a couple of highlights first. Grog dives down into the temple because he's very aware they need to keep Kavarn focused away from the roof where the ranged attackers and the casters are. Pike and Scanlan are pulled into the temple. Clarota and Kima enter themselves on purpose. 
Keyleth dives in as an earth elemental and grapples onto Kavarn to try to pull him further down, keep him away from the roof where the ranged attackers are. Anytime any of the PCs are near the cages at the side of the walls, one of the monsters reaches out and grapples onto them. It happens to Pike and it happens to Grog at the end of the episode. Vax swings in on a rope and attacks Kavarn full swashbuckler mode. Percy keeps shooting at Kavarn and he has an ability called Headshot. Ordinarily, it's meant to disorient the attacker so that they have disadvantage on their attacks for a full round, but Kavarn does not make attacks. He just fires beams that other people have to save against. So Matt rules that this is going to give everybody else advantage on the saves against Clarota's eye beams. This is huge. And Percy does this to Kavarn every round for the full five rounds of the fight. Keyleth at one point hurls Grog up onto Kavarn and Grog grabs onto the horn. It does not come free and Grog makes himself the target of attacks, all the eye ray attacks for like a full round. Incidentally, Grog is briefly killed, but Pike is able to revivify him. Tiberius tries to go down and get some of the Mind Flayers to come up to the top of the temple with him, get them there a little bit faster so they're not going through the corridors of the temple. But even though he's very persuasive, he does not succeed in bringing any of them up with him. Percy shoots at one of the chains that's holding up the arcane device that they destroyed, and it swings and bashes into Kavarn and does like a bunch of damage and knocks some of his armor off and lowers his AC, which is very, very cool. Can I run over to Grog? Uh, you can, you can try to go ahead and you have to try and break the, uh... The grapple is off. That's right, the grapple's got hit. All right, yeah, so you can go do that. Okay, so, um... Come on, Matt, can't you remember where ten people are at once? <laughs> <laughs> Vex kills Kavarn, sends an arrow straight into his central eye, but then the Horn of Orcus glows with necrotic energy, and Kavarn is reanimated as an undead beholder. Because again, that horn comes from Orcus, the demon prince of undeath. Kima is turned to stone by one of Kavarn's rays. This is starting to turn against the party a little bit. Tiberius kills Kavarn again using a glacial blast, and thanks to the sorcerer points that he has, he can use his bonus action to use telekinesis to pull the horn free from Kavarn's head. Which is good, because the horn was starting to glow again. He was definitely going to come back to life. And that's the end of the episode. So let's talk about the elephant in the room. How Tiberius slash Orion behaves in this episode. And yes, I did make a video about Tiberius already. My goal here is not to continue to pile onto somebody who has not been on Critical Role for the past seven years. And a lot of us, I'm including myself here, could stand to internalize some of these lessons. Because the way this episode is often discussed, not just in the comments of my previous video, but generally just in the Critical Role fandom, Orion is considered the villain of this episode, and he's often described as metagaming, or being selfish or having main character syndrome. I'm just going to say, I really don't think that's what's happening in this combat. I'm not going to fully let him off the hook because I think that we all have some accountability for how we behave when we are frustrated. But I am also going to really push back against the commonly held wisdom around this episode and around this fight. Because let's see what we can learn from this episode. Let's talk about the plan the party makes. If you watch closely, which you don't have to do, but I did, Orion thought that the plan was to liberate the Mind Flayers from Mind Control and then leave and go recruit the Mind Flayers. He didn't make it especially clear to the other players or he misunderstood their plan, but either way, there's a misalignment there. There's a miscommunication there. But I don't lay that entirely at his feet. There are eight players at the table, nine if you count Matt. Additionally, in the next episode, episode 12, Orion tells the audience that he was still having trouble with the idea that Maybe Matt is not trying to kill them. That's a difficult idea to shake. Matt really enjoys playing into the idea of playing these dangerous monsters. And if Orion is struggling with the idea that the Dungeon Master is trying to kill them, then it's very easy for him to see that in an episode like this and not separate those feelings. Everything we just talked about boils down to miscommunication. Plain and simple, just n normal human nature stuff. Tiberius says five times in the first half of the episode that he does not want to go into Kavarn's lair. And setting aside how he's expressing his sentiment, more on that in a little bit, it's a valid strategic point. You rarely want to fight a monster in its lair. You're at an extreme disadvantage comparatively. In response, some of the players seem to ask him, well, what's your plan instead? And they're working on formulating one, but it's really not that long in between making the plan and them being at Kavarn's temple. I think a couple of the players would have appreciated a little bit more time to be 
solid about their plan. I'm not only saying that that is something that Orion would have appreciated. There were definitely a couple of players still trying to figure out exactly what the plan was. I think they sort of weirdly pressured themselves into fighting a beholder in this episode, maybe because they knew that the audience was expecting it. They were still interacting with the audience a lot, maybe because they were expecting it and they didn't want to go home and stress about it for another week. I don't know, there could be lots of reasons. Actually, yeah, actually there's another factor. The next episode, they weren't gonna have like half the cast. You can't really do the beholder fight two weeks later, can you? They would definitely do that now. But at the time, that's there was no frame of reference that that was something they could do. He's not even the only one who says they don't have to go into the temple. One of the times that he says it, Keyleth responds, well, yeah, we don't have to go in. That's less than an hour from when they roll initiative, and they had not all gotten on the same page about whether or not they were going to try to go and fight Kavarn or leave and get the Mind Flayers. Folks often say that Orion is metagaming in this episode because he clearly knew things about the Beholder that other people didn't know, so that's why he made the decisions he made. I don't personally see that in this episode. Yes, the Beholder does have a eye ray that comes out of its central eye that causes anti-magic. The first person to mention that in the episode is Travis. Orion's clear concern, Tiberius's clear concern, is fighting the Beholder in its lair. Maybe we can call that metagaming for the concept of layer actions existing in D&D, but personally, I just think that's kind of a stretch. Tiberius sets up a rope attached to an immovable rod right at the top of the temple, presumably so that people who get into the temple can come back up. Again, it's not 100% clear. We do have some communication issues in this episode. The moment Tiny hits the temple and causes his destruction, Tiberius rushes down and he says out loud, I'm going to go pick everyone up. And as he does so, Marisha asks, are we leaving? And it's not facetious, it's not sarcastic, it's a genuine question. It was still on the table. When initiative is rolled, there was a distinct possibility that they might just try to leave and recruit the Mind Flayers. After all, Tiberius's goal has been to get the Mind Flayer out of the lair. No one could figure out a way to do that. If they all just left, who's to say? There's a possibility it would have followed. That's not how he expresses it in the episode. I don't even know if that's what he had in mind. I am watching this seven years later. I have no idea what anyone at the table was technically thinking, but there was still a chance that they would just leave. But Grog dives in because his point is sound. If they're gonna fight it here, and he's at the top of the initiative order, so he's kind of declaring that they are, and they all kind of think they probably are, then they need to have someone down in the chamber floor to keep Kavarn's eye moving, keep it away from the top of the temple and looking at people down below. But the other thing is, Orion did not know how long it would take him to move the carpet. That's not him trying to stay away from the fight. That's Matt saying, this is how fast the carpet is, and this is how high you could go based on how much you wanted the giant to fall. So this is what your turns look like. Let's look at the five rounds of combat in this fight, and we can see this issue playing out in real time. Because the main issue in this episode is not metagaming, or main character syndrome, or any of the other things that we might start seeing in future episodes. This is about communication and the dedication to a specific plan. Round one. Tiberius travels down on the carpet and he gets halfway back to the temple roof. And that's the end of his turn. And honestly, I think that's the moment that he lost any opportunity to bring party members with him to go recruit Mind Flayers. Because by the time he gets to the temple roof on his next turn, too much has happened. Kavarn also telekinetically pulls Pike into the temple. That does not help matters either. Then Clarota comes in and Orion gets really frustrated at that because he was really hoping that Clarota would talk to the other Mind Flayers. He doesn't seem to have internalized the idea that Clarota may not be listened to by the other Mind Flayers, but part of that is because I'm not 100% sure that Clarota has internalized that information. Clarota seems to think that if they rescue the Mind Flayers, he will be welcomed back with open arms. I think maybe Orion slash Tiberius just thought that counted as soon as the mind control broke, not after Kavarn was killed. But also, Matt is running an encounter, and he doesn't understand what Orion is specifically frustrated by, so he can't really answer that or have Clarota go with him instead. He, he sends Clarota into the fight, which is where the action is. When Keyleth takes the form of an earth elemental and grapples onto Kavarn, she shouts, go, get away. So seemingly, she has a similar idea as Orion, get out of here and go get some mind flares. But the other party members, aside from Tiberius, are not the ones who are likely to do that. Round two, Tiberius finishes the journey down. He tries to do like a double move or clarify that he wants to go as fast as he can, but Matt says, this is the speed of the carpet. It cannot go faster. You can't use your 
action to make it dash. That's just not how it works. So instead of going to the temple roof, he goes a little bit further aside so he can see more of the city and try to see where the mind flayers are. That's it, that's the end of his turn. There is no request for a roll, nothing happens. His first two turns were burned based on his placement before initiative was rolled. Then Scanlan is pulled into the chamber. At this point, half of the party members are in the temple with Kavarn. Actually, I think more than that. I think Kima's in there at this point too. At this point, there's no chance of salvaging his plan of having as many people as possible go talk to the Mind Flayers. Round three, after a bit of miscommunication about what is realistic for him to do or not, partially just D&D stuff, partially because of his own misreading of the situation, eventually what happens is this. He flies down on the carpet as close to the Illithids as he can get, and he takes the form of Clarota. And he talks to the Mind Flayers, and they realize, they look at him, they're like, this is not Clarota. Clarota doesn't talk out loud, like, we know this is not what's going on. And he admits, yeah, I am not Clarota. I took a form of an Illithid to talk to you. And he tries to get some of the Mind Flayers to come up onto the carpet and come up to the top of the temple with him. Because that way they can get to the top of the temple as quickly as possible. They can get to Kavarn immediately. And he gets a 25 on his persuasion check. Now, I'm not saying that it should have been easier or harder or whatever, but he rolls a 25, gets about as high as is reasonable to get, but Matt feels that that is not high enough. There's too much going on. There's too many factors. The Mind Flayers don't go with him, but they also don't attack him. And his response to that, this this is the version of Tiberius, of Orion, that I wish we could see in more of this episode. Because yes, it didn't quite go the way he wanted, but he ultimately takes this moment in stride. Well, I guess that was something. Right. <laughs> yeah, it might have been. He yeah, might have started yeah, yeah. it. He didn't get mind blasted three times. That's good. Sometimes that's what you have to do, especially if you are not having the game that you thought you were gonna have, that you wanted to have. You just have to do your best and let the rest of it roll off your back. But at this point, he's also communicated directly with the party over their earrings that he is mad at them. That's the version we got for more of the episode. Round four, he gets to the top of the temple and he tries to use telekinesis to remove the horn from Kavarn's head, but fails. So he uses his bonus action with his sorcerer points to telekinetically pull off one of Kavarn's eye stalks instead. Round five, he wants to pull off more eye stalks but then he discovers there are nine left, which is kind of silly. And Vex slash Laura keeps urging him, just, just shoot him. You're probably gonna get the kill. Tiberius shoots him with a glacial blast and he does get the kill, but the horn starts glowing with dark energy. And before anything else can happen, he uses the last of his sorcerer points. I know that's a whole topic of debate in the critical role community as well, but let's assume that he had the exact number of sorcerer points. And then he uses his bonus action to remove the horn from the head of Kavarn. He's pretty salty at this moment because other people say that they want to help or do something about that, but he points out that it's his turn, kind of loudly, kind of abrasively. Again, I don't think the strategy is the real problem here. It's the communication. Technically, he's he's maybe not right, but at least making a valid point. We don't know when Kavarn is gonna come back to life. Last time he came back to life on his turn, but it was also immediately after Vex's turn. So there's no guarantee that he's going to wait for his turn and in initiative to come back. Thanks to his sorcerer points, at the very least, he can try. He can at least try for the horn. Nothing beats a failure but a try. And if he fails, which he did last time, then they're in the same situation either way and someone else can try on their turn, but he's gonna try. It's a valid point. He may not be right, we don't know, but it's reasonable. It's a reasonable argument. My feeling is that for m most of this episode, the problem really isn't what he's trying to say. It's just how he's saying it. That to me is the big lesson we can learn from here. Yeah, there's a lot of miscommunication in this episode. And yes, ultimately, it would be a lot better if that didn't happen. But you cannot control miscommunication at the table. You can do your best. You can start to do things that will cut down on that. We'll talk about those in future episodes on this show for sure. But really what we can learn from is what do you do after the communication has happened, after things have gone wrong and you're annoyed? What can you do? Because I've mentioned some things that would have frustrated him, but... None of that really gives you an excuse to pout or to complain or to dig your heels in because things aren't going your way. You are playing a team game with your friends and you need to be able to read the room and realize that potentially you are making a tense fight into an awkward or uncomfortable or frustrating situation. The ideal thing in this scenario, and no, I'm not trying to say what this guy should have done seven years ago, I'm trying to say what we can do if it happens to us is try to communicate why you're doing what you're doing. I have a video that goes into more detail on this coming out on Monday, but let me give you an example. If I was Tiberius's player and it's round three and I finally have a chance to do 
the thing that I wanted to do. Instead of complaining about the other players, I might say something like this. Okay, so Tiberius thought, and I would speak in third person, Tiberius thought the plan was to go and get the Mind Flayers immediately and not stay and fight Kavarn, so he's gotta, he still feels like that's the best option. So he's gonna go down and try to recruit the Mind Flayers and see what, see what they can do. Because in that scene, Vex even does suggest that. And Tiberius says he is going to do that. Wouldn't it be nice if he was volunteering information more? Wouldn't it be nice to do that at your table? At the end, when he pulls the horn free, instead of loudly declaring, it's my turn, maybe saying something like, I know, I'm sure any one of you could pull it off as well, but we don't know when he's going to come back to life. I have the sorcerer points, I might as well try, just in case he comes back immediately. Really, how is that any different than what he's saying at the table? It's the exact same sentiment. It's just being communicated differently. And partially, it is about not taking things as personally. And that is hard for some people. I know that, I understand that. D&D, by its very nature, generates genuine, complex, emotional reactions. We as players want to believe in the secondary world. We as DMs want our players to believe in the secondary world. So what, now am I here saying, don't get too attached? Don't get emotionally invested in the things that happen in the game that is designed to emotionally invest you? Maybe better just to say, never lose sight of the fact that you are playing a game with your friends. That should always be the priority. Miscommunication happens at the table. This is by no means the last time it's gonna happen on Critical Role. It seems worse this time because one of the players got really frustrated by it. Again, it's not the last time that's gonna happen either. But when this happens, all we can do, all we can do is try to have the ability to laugh at ourselves and make the best out of a bad situation. It's not always possible but it's something to try for. And don't blame other people for how they played the game. That's another factor. You don't want to play the game for other people. Well, you might want that, but try not to. Orion is genuinely upset at the other players for something they did that in his mind seems, well, suboptimal doesn't seem the word, but ill-advised may be more accurate. This is something we need to be conscious of when we're playing, especially those of us who think tactically and know the game really well especially if we value making cool and strategic moves in battle. And that is why I have so much sympathy for Orion in this episode. Now, I've been in the same situation as him where the plan is crumbling around your heads, and generally I think I've handled that part a lot better. If you've played D&D with me and you can think of a time when I didn't, then text me. I, as far as I know, I can't think of a time where I didn't just laugh it off, roll with it. But I have done something Vaguely similar, I have tried to coach or guide or instruct players on how they should be playing. That's not my job, that's not my role. I'll make another video about this because I think I've grown a lot as a player, but a lot of that change happened like within the last year. We're all on our own journeys, ultimately. My goal in this series is not to continue to pile onto Orion every week, although there will be installments of this series where that's going to be challenging not to do. But ultimately, I think a lot of this episode is unfairly laid at his feet, or at the very least, dramatically mischaracterized. The problem here is not main character syndrome. The problem here is not metagaming. The problem here is communication and taking the game a little bit too seriously, which I know is a wild thing to accuse Critical Role of because that is often the point of the game for these players, but Hopefully I've illustrated my point about what I'm trying to communicate there. Thank you for watching. We'll be back in two weeks with episode 13. Episode 12 is an intro video where they just talk about how to play D&D, mainly because half the cast was gone and they didn't want to do a main episode without them. Matt shares advice for how to DM, and then they run an improvised one-shot for a few members of the Geek and Sundry team. If folks want me to talk about that one, let me know and I'll get to it at some point. But in the meantime, we're going to jump right to episode 13, Escape from the Underdark. The opening of that episode, probably the first half, has a lot more stressful Tiberius content, so I can't really recommend it as part of the rewatch, but we're definitely gonna have a lot to talk about when we get to that episode. See you there in two weeks. But also, I have other videos that come out every Monday and Thursday. Check them out if you like my content. If you wanna support the channel, there are a few ways you can do that. You can subscribe and ring the bell to get notified as soon as new videos come out. You can support me on Patreon. The more people who support the channel, the more likely I'll be able to hire an editor and make these videos more often. You can join the Discord and become a part of the community, which is a lot of fun. And you can sign up for my newsletter to get the occasional update. The links for all those are in the doobly-doo below. Thank you so much for watching, and until next time, play fair and have fun.